morning, church, and happy Resurrection Sunday. My name is Kendall, and our scripture from today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. This is the word of the Lord. I want you to imagine with me, you go home today or tomorrow or sometime this week, and as you uh, make your way to your home, you notice a strange man in front of your house. And uh, if you're anything like my wife, you assume the end is near because there's a stranger present. Uh, but if not, uh, you, you begin to make your way toward this man. And as you approach him, he hands you an envelope. You look at the envelope. It's got you know, an attorney's name where the, the sender goes. And your name is the recipient. You open the envelope. And as you pull out the letter that it contains, you see that you are the recipient of a great fortune Like, you have now inherited a ton of money. Big as you want, you can just imagine, like, all the money you can spend. Um, So it would be a good day. I mean, most of us would receive that as fairly good news. I would be excited. I would give it all the missions, y'all. I would probably spend some on me. But I would be, you know, I'd be grateful. I'd be responsible with it. Uh, But if I did receive a letter like that, and if you received a letter like that, and you're anything like me, you might receive it with a little bit of skepticism. Because when I was a kid, we used to get the publisher's clearinghouse stuff in the mail. And I didn't tell my parents, but sometimes I like filled out the info and sent it back. You know, I was just hoping. Uh, but my ship never did come in. Uh, I've got a few emails from Nigerian princes that didn't work out either. And so it's made me a little bit skeptical in this life that the things that people promise or the things that I might, you know, be told to be true, I might be a little bit skeptical that they are true. Now, whether you're skeptical or not, if you got that letter from an attorney that says you're the recipient of a vast fortune, whatever that might be, you would still receive it as good news. And so today... I don't know what your story is. I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know if maybe you're a kid and your parent drug you here or you're a spouse who got the it's Easter, you better be here kind of glance or, or why you've wound up here today. Uh, but what I want to tell you about is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you may be here today and you have a level of skepticism about that. And you're like, I'm not really sure if that's even true. I'm not sure how I feel about it. Uh, But I want to invite you to look into the Word of God with me and to investigate what it has to say about this gospel, about this good news. And ultimately, I want to invite you to trust Jesus and to receive the good news of the gospel into your life as well. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to begin in verse 1. Now, Paul is writing a letter to the church at Corinth, and he spent a little bit of time there. He spent over a year and a half with these people. He showed up in the city that never heard of Jesus Christ. They never knew the gospel. He had shared this gospel message with them, and many of them had uh, believed it. And so in verse 1, it says, Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you. Now, gospel here, if you're a Greek scholar and you don't need to be to understand this, uh, it just means good news. When we say the gospel, you hear it in church, it only means good news. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So what is the gospel? What is the good news of Jesus Christ? 
Well, the good news is that Paul is going to give us the essentials of the gospel here. He says this in verse 3. He says, For I delivered you to you as of first importance what I also received. And so when he says of first importance here, he's giving us the essentials of the gospel. Now, this isn't all, this isn't everything you could ever mind. This isn't a full knowledge of all of the Bible and all of God's plans. But these are the key components of the gospel that you need to understand. And so he says this in verse 4, or verse 3. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And so it's a few things that you've probably heard before. If you've been raised here in the South or you've been in church or went to Sunday school, you've probably heard that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried, and then he was raised on the third day day. That's what the resurrection is all about. That's why we're celebrating today. Now, anytime you're trying to determine if something is true, uh, whether it's trustworthy, you should start by confirming things that you already know. So if, if you're here and you, you know, you're a little bit skeptical, I, I'm going to point out for you first things that we kind of know to be true. So if you're a student of history, you like to read, you like to kind of dig a little bit, uh, you know that almost no one debates whether or not Jesus Christ existed, whether a man named Jesus existed who lived in the region of Judea, who claimed to be the Messiah, who was ultimately handed over by Pilate to be crucified on a Roman cross at a place called Golgotha. I mean, you're gonna, if you were to read non-Christian literature from the first century, they're going to chronicle the life and death of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's, it's well attested historically. And so we know that Jesus did indeed come and live and die here on this earth. So that's something we know to be true about this story. Uh, but additionally, almost no one debates whether or not Jesus was buried. On the night that Jesus was crucified, it was the night before the Passover, and it would have been incredibly offensive to have bodies hanging on crosses during the Passover. And so the Roman soldiers, they came there to the crosses. There were men crucified on either side of Jesus, and in order to speed up the process of death, they would break their legs such that when they hung there, they would asphyxiate more quickly. But when they found Jesus, they found that he'd already breathed his last. He'd cried out, Tetelestai, it is finished. And he died there on the cross. But just to make sure, they took a spear and they thrust it through his side and blood and water flowed out. And then ultimately, those Roman soldiers, those professional executioners, they took his body down off the cross and they gave it to a man named Joseph of Arimathea. And they took the body and they placed it in the tomb of that man, Joseph, and they sealed the, the tomb with a stone and they placed a guard of Roman soldiers there. That would have been 16 soldiers. Now, again, if you're a student of history, you read Christian literature and non-Christian literature alike, virtually everyone agrees that Jesus Christ uh, lived in the, the region of Judea, that he was crucified on the cross, and that he was placed into the tomb. And just in the same way, um, almost no one debates that three days later, the tomb was found to be empty. Now, it's interesting because as you begin to read in the literature, you study various scholars, they'll, they'll come up with various reasons for why the tomb was empty. But almost no one debates the fact that it was. So some of the theories about why the tomb was found to be empty, uh, some people would say, well, the disciples of Jesus, um, they snuck in, overpowered the Roman soldiers, they rolled the stone away, and they stole his body. And it was never found, but that's what happened to the body of Jesus. But again, they don't debate that the tomb was found empty. Uh, another theory is that, well, even though the Roman soldiers determined that Jesus was dead, even though they thrust the spear through his side and the blood and water poured out, and even though he'd spent three days in the grave, Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. The theory is that he just swooned and that in his weakened, nearly dead state, uh, somehow he was able to unwrap himself, move the stone on his own, overpower the Roman soldiers and sneak away to where no one found him, right? Uh, that's another theory. But again, regardless of the theory that people might put forward, um, most everyone would agree that there was a man by the name of Jesus Christ who lived in the region of Judea, who claimed to be the Messiah, who ultimately was handed over by Pilate to be crucified on the Roman cross at a place called Golgotha. He was taken down from that cross and he was placed in a tomb where he was buried 
And three days later, that tomb was found to be empty. Now, those are the facts that almost everyone agrees on. But there are two components to this story that are really profound that we need to understand. You see, Jesus, this, this story that Paul writes to the Corinthians, Paul is going to claim that Jesus didn't merely die on the cross, but that he died on the cross for the sins of the world. I don't know where you are in your understanding of sin or whether you've come to faith in Jesus Christ and trusted him and his work on the cross to save you from your sins. But something that Paul says here is really significant for us to understand whether you're a believer or not. Paul says that everything about this gospel message, everything that he's just told them hinges upon one thing. And that's the other part of this. That is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul himself, he wrote just later in this chapter, you can go on and read it uh, as we leave here today. He said, if Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, if Jesus Christ wasn't raised from the dead on the third day, he tells us as believers that our faith is in vain. He said, if Jesus Christ is still in the grave, or if they stole his body, if he did, was not resurrected from the dead, then you and I as believers in Jesus Christ, we're still in our sins. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, as a matter of fact, Paul takes it a step further. This one hurts a little bit. He says, we are most to be pitied among men, that the world should look at us, and they should just say, man, bless his heart. Man, I feel so terrible for those people. They're such fools. They stake their life on this thing. And Paul says, if Jesus wasn't resurrected, our faith is in vain. We're still in our sins, and we are most to be pitied among men. Now, here's the thing. If Jesus was indeed raised from the dead, according to the Scriptures, which what he's referencing are former scriptures, the psalmist who prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus would ever be uh, crucified, before he would ever live here. The psalmist actually prophesied that Jesus would indeed, he wouldn't face decay, that he would be resurrected. And if that is true, if Jesus was raised from the dead according to the scriptures, then we can also trust that according to the scriptures, he died on the cross for our sins. If Jesus did raise from the dead, then we can trust that he was no ordinary man man, but rather we can understand that Jesus was indeed who he claimed to be. He was the Messiah. He was God in flesh who overcame the grave. If Jesus rose from the dead, that changes everything. And so Paul is going to spend most of his time here in this first part of this chapter speaking to us and giving us evidence that Jesus was indeed raised from the dead. So look with me here in verse 4. Oh, I'm sorry, in verse 5. Verse 4, I was right. He says that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas. You all know who Cephas is. This was Peter. This was the Apostle Peter who, by the way, if there was anyone in the Bible who was like uh, Eastern Oklahoma redneck, it was Peter. He was kind of bold and kind of brash, and he didn't follow the conventions of his day. And so Jesus was actually prophesying. He's like, hey, I'm going to go to be with the Father. And, and Peter's like, no way. Man, I'm not going to let it happen. Jesus, even if I have to die for you, I'm never going to deny you. I'm with you full on. And, and Jesus looks at Peter, and he says, hey, Peter. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times today. And sure enough, when Jesus was arrested, they took him to the house of the high priest. And there out on the front lawn of the high priest, Peter stood warming his hands over a charcoal fire. And there was a little slave girl who had no standing in first century culture. A little slave girl came up to him and were like, hey, Peter, weren't you one of those guys who was with Jesus? And he was like, no, I don't know who you're talking about. It must have been somebody that looks like me, you know. Ordinary face, lot, you know, mistake me a lot. She's like, no, 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 you're, you're a Galilean. I can hear it in your voice like you were one of the guys with Jesus. No, I don't know who Jesus is. I don't know what you're talking about. And a third time, he, he was accused of being one of the disciples. And Peter actually curses and swears he does not know that man. And then the rooster crowed. <laughs> 
Now, it's an interesting choice that the Apostle Paul would use Peter as evidence of the resurrected Christ, isn't it? I mean, Peter, the guy who was a failed apostle, he clearly denied even knowing who Jesus was to a little slave girl. But that wasn't the end of Peter's story. As a matter of fact, something profound happened. Between the time that Peter denied Jesus and over the next few weeks, something so profound happened that the man who once denied Jesus became one of his foremost uh, uh, preachers, if you will. He actually stood up on the day of Pentecost when the, the, the Jews who had shot and crucify him were surrounding Peter on the day of Pentecost. Peter stood up and preached boldly and fearlessly, and he proclaimed that Jesus was was the Son of God, who died on the cross for the sins of the world, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, Peter stood up and boldly proclaimed the gospel. And so we've got to ask ourselves a question. What in the world happened in Peter's life that over just a period of a few weeks, the man who denied even knowing him became the fierce proclaimer of the gospel, who boldly shared, and not only that, but spent the rest of his existence witnessing and testifying that Jesus was the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins and was buried and raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And Peter would ultimately be martyred for his faith and his testimony. What happened in the life of Peter that changed everything for him? Well, Paul tells us that Peter saw the risen Christ that Jesus had appeared to him and he saw the wounds in his wrist and his ankles and the hole in his side. And when Peter saw the resurrected Christ, that changed everything for him. Though he was once the denier, he became a devoted follower because he'd seen the resurrected Christ. Now that's not all the evidence that Paul offers. He also mentions the 12 apostles. If you know much of the story, again, when Jesus was arrested, all 12 apostles, they deserted Jesus. One was so fearful. He was so eager to get away, so quick to not want to be associated with Jesus. It says that he fled naked. He left his cloak behind. He was so terrified. He got out of there as quickly as he could. And yet, every one of the apostles over the period of the next few weeks would see something would experience something so profound that those men who were terrified, who deserted Jesus in his most significant hour, they would go on to become ferocious witnesses for the gospel. Every one of them but one would be martyred for their faith. And the one who wasn't martyred was was John, who was boiled in tar and exiled to Patmos for his testimony about Jesus Christ. And I ought to ask you again, what happened in the lives of these men that they went from deserting Jesus in its most critical time to becoming lifelong followers of him who gave their lives sharing the gospel. And I would argue, just as Paul tells us, that they had seen our resurrected Savior. They had seen Jesus in the flesh. But maybe you're a more devoted skeptic. Maybe for you, you're like, oh, of course the apostles. They all claim that sort of thing, right? Uh, Did anyone outside see the resurrected Christ? And the apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth. And by the way, when he wrote this letter, this was just about 30 years after the time of Christ. All right? So he writes and he tells us in verse 6, he says, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And so what the Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, he was like, hey, you know, if you don't trust Peter, I mean, you don't believe the testimony of the apostles, and there's not one, not two, not five, not 50, not 100. There are 500 other people out there that you can sit down to face to face and say, hey, what did you see? And those men and those women will testify that they have seen the risen Christ. There's more than 500 witnesses that you could go and talk to. Now, he acknowledges some of these people may have passed away. But for the most part, most of them still would have been living. And they could have told you what they had seen and they had heard. But Paul's still not done. Verse 7 says, Then he appeared to James. Now, James is a half-brother of Jesus. And much like Peter and the apostles, um, James had denied that Jesus was the Messiah. 
As a matter of fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, when Jesus had come to minister in their hometown, uh, he was ashamed of his brother. He was like, man, you need to go, you need to go minister somewhere else. Like, you're not welcome here. They sent him away. Actually, James doubted Jesus for Jesus' entire life. But then something happened in the life of James that made him go from being a, a denier to, again, a devoted follower. Can I ask you a question? Anybody have siblings in the room? What would it take in order for you to believe that your sibling was the Son of God and the Messiah of the world. Y'all, I have a sister. She ain't it, right? She's good, right? But she's not the daughter of God. She's not the Savior of the world, and I know that clearly. You know what I believe happened in the life of James? It's exactly what James would have told you if, he had, if you were able to ask him. He saw the risen Christ. And that changed everything for him. James, according to tradition, went on to be martyred for his faith as well. But Paul has one more evidence for us to consider. In verse 7, it says he appeared to James and then all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Paul's like autobiography time here. The Apostle Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was very zealous for the Jewish traditions. He'd out-excelled all of his peers in his study. He could quote more Bible than all of us, right? I mean, he was in the Word. He believed the Scriptures. He was a faithful Jew, trained under the leading Jewish scholar named Gamaliel. Hebrew of Hebrew, Pharisees of Pharisees. And he was so zealous for the traditions of his father's that when people started following Jesus, when people believed the gospel and started following after what he called the way, following after Jesus, the apostle Paul had given his life to persecuting them. He went to the rulers of the synagogues to get letters so that he could find people who followed Jesus and he would have them thrown in prison or flogged. The apostle Paul was the man who held the coats of the men who took stones and they beat Stephen to death for testifying that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. But something profound happened in the heart of this man, Paul. So profound that the persecutor of the church became its foremost evangelist. Paul claimed to have seen the risen Christ, and that changes everything. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain. If Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, then we're still in our sins. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then we are most to be pitied among all men. But if Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, then this message, this good news of the gospel, it changes everything for us. If Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, then that means that he is indeed God, that what he said about himself was true, that he was the Son of God, that he died on the cross for the sins of the world, he was buried and was raised on the the third day that ultimately Jesus would appear to many people in many places at many different times before he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And so you might ask, what does this mean for me? Why do we celebrate like this? What, what is all Easter about? Why, why do we care so much about the resurrection? And I want to give you three reasons that the resurrection is important. Why it's so significant to us. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It means that we have freedom from sin. You know, I, I don't pastor in some place where people don't know my story. I pastor in my hometown. I pastor alongside men and women who watched me grow up. Some of you grew up with me. And you saw the good and the bad and the ugly. And what you may not known, have known about me was I grew up with a profound amount of shame. Y'all, if anybody had a chance to get it right in this life, it was me. I was raised by two godly parents. Man, they took me to church. They taught me the word. 
Man, many people in this church even invested in me. Sunday school, vacation, Bible school, church. I've done it all. If anybody had a chance to get it right, it was me. But I didn't. I rebelled against God. And I've hurt many of you personally. I've sinned against you. And I was carrying a weight of shame that I could not bear anymore. Years ago, I sat down with a counselor, and I'm trying to work through all this. And he gave me an assignment, which you kind of hate, by the way. He said, I want you to go home and take out a sheet of paper, and I want you to write down all of your sins, all the people you've hurt, the people you sinned against, and how you sinned against them. And I did. And man, it was, it was almost overwhelming. Like, to put it into writing and to acknowledge all the people I'd hurt and all the ways that I'd sinned. And it was a substantial list. Like, I'm, I had several columns, you know. And he told me to, when I was done to take that sheet of paper. And I did. I took it outside on my back porch. And I lit it on fire. And I watched as the fire began to consume that piece of paper the wind blew the ashes away, and I held it until the whole thing was gone. If Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, then Jesus Christ has come to set us free from our sins. What, if the Bible is true when it tells us that he was raised from the cross, uh, uh, raised from the dead according to the scriptures, the Bible is also true when it tells us that he died on the cross for our sins. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this, that God made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, which means he was perfect in every way. God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of Christ in him. And here's what that means. It's the great exchange. That means for those of us who had come to faith in Christ, God would take all of our sin, the past, present, and the future. And by the way, he knows your story. He knows your name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows it all. And God looked down from heaven in the broken world that was scarred by sin. And he chose to die for us. He chose to die for you. And there on the cross, God took our sin and our guilt and my shame and your shame. And he placed it on his son, Jesus. And Jesus paid the just penalty for sin. Jesus endured the wrath that I deserve, that we deserve for our sins. He paid that debt in full. And whereas the cross, Jesus cries out and he says, it is finished. The debt is paid. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is like the receipt that we have that says paid in full. Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He wasn't just an ordinary man who was crucified on the cross and forgotten in history. Jesus was raised from the dead, victorious over sin and death. And that is a testament to us that Jesus is who he said he was and that he accomplished everything that he said he had accomplished. If Jesus has been raised from the dead, then we have been, have been set free from our sin and our guilt and our shame, the debt against us has been paid in full. It's been canceled. Which means that we can now enjoy a relationship with the creator of the world who loved us enough to send his son to die in our place. That we can be restored to wholeness and life in him. If the resurrection is true, and I believe it is, that means that we have freedom from sin but it also means that we have power for today. Y'all, I'm not perfect yet. <clears throat> I'm working on it. I don't feel like I'm getting close. I still stumble and I still fall. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that our Savior is not in the grave, but rather He ascended into heaven and He sat down at the right hand of the Father and He is ruling and reigning over everything there. And the Scriptures tell us that when Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, He ultimately sent His Holy Spirit to live within the hearts of every man and woman who would come to Him in faith. The same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now lives in us, which means we have strength for today. We have strength to overcome the sinful tendencies in our lives, our patterns of behavior that we've repeated over and over and over. The power of God now lives within us to set us free from those things that we can newly live new lives in Him. Jesus said, I came that they might have life 
and have it to the full. Eternal and abundant life doesn't start the day that you die or Jesus returns. The eternal and abundant life begins the day that you come to faith in Jesus and receive the power of his Holy Spirit to help you live that victorious life in him. I don't know what your story is. Maybe you walked in here today and you're full of bitterness and anger and unforgiveness. Maybe for you, you've got broken relationships that just string behind you all over the place. Maybe for you, it's been years of addiction. And there's brokenness and pain. Jesus rose victorious over sin and death and the grave. And he sends his spirit to live within us that we might live victorious Christian lives today. That you don't have to be burdened by that hatred or bitterness forever. That you don't have to be mastered by that addiction forever. But there is hope and there is power through the Holy Spirit of God to set you free from the things that once controlled you. That you can now be controlled by the power of the Spirit. That God might bear the fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control in your life. The resurrection means that we have freedom from our sin. It means that we have strength for today. And it means that we have hope for the future. Y'all know the story of the Garden of Eden? It's beautiful. God creates the world and it's perfect in every way. There's no sickness. There's no suffering. There's no pain. There's no strife. Adam and Eve were married and never fought, right? It was perfect, right? Everything was perfect. But then Adam and Eve sinned. They chose to go their own way and to break God's law. And sin enters the world, and it has just reverberated outward ever since. As a matter of fact, if, if you don't have to live long, right? You, if you, you leave this place today, in this very moment, you likely are feeling the effects of sin and the brokenness that is in our world as a result. We know sickness and suffering and pain and death. We've been betrayed. We know the sting of being sinned against in this life. But here's what the Apostle Paul wrote just a little bit later in this chapter, in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. He said, For as in Adam all die, which means when Adam sinned in the garden, he passed that sin nature down to us, and we too have felt that spiritual death due to sin. As in Adam all die die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Which means that just as Jesus rose from the grave to live eternally in heaven with God, so you and I can live eternally with Jesus Christ in heaven forever. The scriptures tell us that Jesus is going to return one day. You're either going to die or Jesus is going to come back. That we'll stand before God that one day Jesus will, have, will create a new heaven and a new earth. We'll be given new bodies and we will rule and reign with him forever. Y'all, I don't want to diminish your struggles, the pain or the suffering of this life. Diminish even what you've been through. But what we know about this life is that it's like the twinkling of an eye. It's like a vapor. It's like one second in the span of eternity. And so while we will endure difficult things in this life, while we will experience suffering while we're here on this earth, it's just for a little while before we see Jesus face to face and we get to live in a new heaven and a new earth that's no longer broken and scarred by sin. There is hope for us for the future that when we stand before God, we won't stand in our own righteousness or goodness, but we will point to the gospel of Jesus Christ that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. Today, I am that strange man standing at your doorway, and I'm delivering a message of good news to you. And what you do with this message makes all the difference in the world. You see, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, in order to receive this free gift that Jesus offers to us, it has to be received in faith. And faith has three components that I want you to see. Faith is believing that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins. Faith is trusting in Jesus to save us from our sins and to give us new life. 
in faith is striving to live a life of obedience to Jesus Christ as the Lord of our life. So today I've delivered the message. And what you do with this message will make all the difference in your life, both now and for eternity. And so I want to invite you over the next few minutes to place your faith and trust in Jesus, to trust your whole life to Him. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank You for the hope of the cross. We thank You for the hope of the resurrection. God, we thank You that You look down on a world that was sinful, on men and women just like me, who have a story and a past, who maybe they spent their whole life walking in shame. God, you look down at us, and rather than, than wanting to give us what we deserve, which was punishment, you loved us enough to send your son Jesus to die in our place, that we might have new life in him and be reconciled to you. God, I pray, pray for the man or woman who's here today, who's never come to faith in you. Lord, maybe they believed a component of the gospel, Oh yeah, I believe that Jesus lived and died. God, I pray that today would be the day that they trust in you, that you died on the cross for their sin. They trust you to save them from their sin and to give you new life. And they begin to live a life of obedience to you. Father, we pray that you might be honored and glorified in this time. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.